I want to open with the thematic for the morning, which is <coughs> land grabs, law, and capitalism, with the first part, which is the question of land. There's a particular way in which land didn't seem to be a central question in capitalism for well over, well, during, this, during the period, let's say, between the 1940s, 1950s, the post-war period, all the way to the 80s. And then again, land becomes a central issue. In what ways has this shown up in your work? In, in, in what ways is land? How is it that land has come to occupy the place that it's come to occupy in, in politics today? Um, I, we should start with Medha and then go on to David. And my request to both the speakers is that in their initial responses, if we could keep it down to around three minutes or so, we could then have a you know, uh, much larger round of responses and build the conversation that way. I suppose you are right that the land has become a crucial factor and a force for both the omnipotent, neoliberal, corporatized, privatized state on one hand and for the people's resistance which is rooted onto and holding onto the land underneath. Now there was a time when the imperial rule in India, the British days, they brought in what is known as the Land Acquisition Act of 1894. The same act is applied and used or misused uh, even today to take over the land after land of the people in the rural to the indigenous communities for the public purpose. Now what is the common good, what is the public purpose and what is the greater common good as Arundhati Roy has called it are the questions that left an answer. But then as that law defined it, the land and everything attached to land, if a piece of land is acquired, forcibly acquisitioned, even within a few hours or days because there is an urgency which is again defined and developed by the decision makers who do not include but exclude the generations old communities living on the same land then everything attached to the land, the surface water, the river flowing, the hills and the mountain ranges, again another form of land, or the aquatic wealth, including the groundwater or the fisheries. Minerals worth crores of rupees would then be acquired along with that piece of land. So it is really first commodifying the property, then legitimizing taking over which amounts to grabbing when it is crudely and brutally done even if law is the weapon and then killing the communities and the life over there which may be more sustainable but in the name of and more progressive because it is intergenerational sustainability that they have not only tried out but exhibited and yet taking over that land in the name of progress and that is what is being resisted. And if it is not only the foreign multinationals or the bilateral and the multilaterals who come with one kind of capital, the monetary capital and one kind of mechanism, the market mechanism and then say that everything that you have, the natural resource capital and the human resource capital, that is all nonsense and we know the better and we can take over, then that is something which is to be questioned, which is questioned and challenged. And the Indian multinationals as much as foreign multinationals are also playing a role. But then they are legitimizing all this through the newer and newer policies and the enactments, including the Special Economic Zones Act, which got passed within five days in the Parliament of India, with almost consensus across the parties, left to right and which gave the domain to the industries in the form of foreign territories which is a legitimate entity according to the act that big chunks of land and everything with priority and preference is to be transferred to the haves taking over from the have-nots. Now they are changing the land acquisition act just the last line towards what? They are now saying that we are not going to acquire land for the corporates anymore. What they are going to include now 
in the new amendment which was to come during last three parliaments and we are opposed every time sitting in front of the parliament. This time again they are going to try and we are going to uh, derail it. Uh, it certainly says that the public purpose is to be defined to include defense projects, infrastructure projects, that includes education, health, everything is now infrastructure. And then the third category of any project or any plan by any purpose, person for any public use. <laughs> so even the foreign university and infrastructure of the highway flyover type, everything will be now taken as public purpose for which if they purchase 70% land, the rest 30% would be acquired. So there will obviously be no bargaining power and no option but to sell the land in the 70% Otherwise, you would not even get the cash compensation. So people are resisting this and challenging this. David? Yeah, let me, let me start at uh, the other end. Um, I have to say it's a great privilege to be here with, uh, with you. Um, the Narmada movement was one of the inspirational movements that's occurred over the last 20 years. It's still going on. And uh, I think uh, you managed to get the World Bank out of backing dams and things like that, which is a no mean uh, achievement. And uh, I think, uh, by the way, it's very wonderful to be in this space so close to Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think we should have lots of spaces like this and surround, <laughs> surround them. <laughs> and, you know, do the Maoist peasant strategy, which is one day just invade, you know. So it's, it's wonderful to be back here. I've been here a few times. Um, but let me, let me uh, say something first, which is kind of going to sound very abstract, but I think it is very important. Uh, in, in most economic theories to which we're now exposed, land is treated as a side issue. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we don't really look at it as being as foundational as we should. And we have a dominant economic theory that doesn't really talk about it very much. So uh, the weak side of economic theory is in agricultural economics and urban economics. And that's where inferior economists go because they can't make it with the big people who are doing you know, macroeconomic modeling and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, this also carries over to, to, to Marx's, you know, Marxian political economy. The category of land rent is often treated as some sort of residual that, uh, okay, we get to. Um, much of my work has been about trying to rescue categories like land rent and say they're much more important. And it's now turning out that there's a good deal of historical evidence that the bourgeoisie has made more money out of land speculation than they've made out of factory production. And that is not only a very important fact, uh, for example, in countries like, like Britain, uh, also in the United States, um, but it now carries over to the present time when actually you have a crisis, there's a lot of surplus capital, and nobody knows where to go with it. Uh, it's sort of locked up. But one of the areas you're seeing exploited right now is precisely the land grab, which you are talking about. And the land grab is going on everywhere, not only in India for purposes of, you know, dam construction and the SEZs and all, all the rest of it that, that this, that's been going on there, a rather horrendous kind of recent history. Uh, but you'll see it going on in Africa big time. Uh, it has been going on within, inside of China, where there are very complicated kind of, you know, land ownership uh, relations. And even when it's not direct ownership, there's a way in which the land is being rendered, as it were, subservient to corporate interests. So I go to Latin America uh, quite a lot. And it was about 20 years ago, I saw a crop that I hadn't seen before. I said, what's that? And they said, soybeans. <coughs> and it's now soybeans everywhere. And, and, and Latin America has been turned into one vast soybean plantation. <laughs> Uh, which is in a way co contracted into a kind of agribusiness, agri-commercial business into China and all the rest of it. And there's a, there's a, there's so, so this land grab, I think, 
is very much about trying to find a secure source of profitability and one of the theses that I'm looking at very seriously right now is to say that uh, capital has run out of options for a variety of reasons uh, and so one of the op options that the capitalist class is pursuing is that they hope to live the rest of their lives very comfortably as rentiers and it's not only land of course it's it's uh, patents and, and and licenses and genetic uh, you know and you've had lots of struggles over genetic you know of seeds and that in 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 India but that also is going on on globally and that says to me something about the state of capitalism today so this land grab is not simply just fortuitous I think that it's actually something which is taking off and is becoming much more prominent but it's becoming prominent and, and the economists don't really have a theoretical way to, to understand the dynamics of it. And, and to me, at this phase of, which is a very curious phase in the history of capitalism, uh, at this phase we may be seeing a, a real shift uh, emphasis into uh, land and, and we've seen it already if you look at, for instance, uh, uh, just to move from the agricultural to the to the urban, uh, the role of the land market and property market in this country from 2000 onwards, when uh, the uh, the boom went bust at the end of the 90s, then all of a sudden everything starts to shift into land and property markets. So we get a speculative uh, market there. Now that's crashed, and so we're depressed now, depressed for all sorts of reasons. Um, and <coughs> But, but it's interesting, the one economy that's really going very strongly right now, apart from India, is of course China. And if you look at what's going on in China, property prices in Beijing have increased by 800% over the last six years. Sh and property prices in Shanghai doubled last year. There's a boom going on there. So in other words, speculation in, in land rents and property rents, housing and everything else is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, to the dynamics of what is happening within uh, the, the capitalism right now, both in terms of the crashes and uh, the booms and the crashes uh, which, are, which are going on, and I think it's going to be much, much more serious. Um, this connects also, however, with the idea uh, of that is a very important to me, which is what I would call the economy of dispossession that actually if you're going to, if land is going to become much more significant uh, then you have to dispossess people who are residing on it. And that is one of the things that's going on in, in has been going on I think incredibly after the kind of neoliberal turn in India from say 1990 onwards. It, it, it's just been a phenomenal kind of assault, uh, particularly upon rural peasant populations. But we're seeing the same thing happening in Africa as well. So there's a politics of dispossession going on right now where the capitalist class is getting filthy rich on the basis of this and one of the things that struck me the other day listening to some colleagues from India I was told well you know three years ago there were 26 billionaires in India now there are 69 and so this boom that is supposedly going on in India is not a boom for the masses at all it's a boom which is very much concentrated in a very very small kind of thing which is of course again the neoliberal politics in this country so that's another aspect of it. I mean when I looked in 2002 Uh, very quickly, I want to pull out a couple of things from what both uh, Veda and David said. Uh, the first is, um, I specifically do want to go back to the question of uh, law, uh, because uh, when Veda was speaking about it, the kind of attempts to recraft law. Um, uh, would, I would like David to speak a little about the whole notion of eminent domain and what the history of that has been um, in, in, in in, in accumulation by dispossession or broader, even before that, in uh, earlier form of productive accumulation. And two, uh, Mena, I'd say, in terms of the use of law, uh, can you point to one urban and one rural case? Because one of the things that happens is, especially around India, we primarily think about the rural, whereas, you know, uh, there's a lot of this that's happening and, and some of the complications of how they're doing it within the urban sector is actually um, really, I mean, I think the use of law, etc., is much more complex at some level in urban India. 
uh, and Medha has been primarily um, uh, one, of the, one of the principal people who have been active with the Gharvachar Gharva Gharvanao Andolan, uh, which is an urban uh, uh, land politics uh, organization. So uh, maybe we should start again with David and then come back to me. Yeah, eminent uh, domain is really, uh, you know, uh, for public purpose, which <coughs> you'd have to do, but to be honest, I don't think eminent domain is a real problem. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind using eminent domain. I think that was a very good idea. Um, but the point, the point here is that that actually the way in which the dynamic works, uh, and I'll give you a very specific example. The university I worked in before, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, has a very large hospital and uh, they've been planning to expand and it turns out that they have a, a, a sort of a for-profit corporation which they sponsor, which manages a lot of real estate and, and so on. And they have lots of little subsidiaries, and which you, you, is very difficult to track. Uh, their trick was to go into neighborhoods around the hospital and buy up a property, and then just board it up and leave it empty, which depresses property values, obviously. And after a while, more people move out because it gets more depressed. And then they declare it's a slum and it needs to be cleared, you know, because it's rat infested and all the rest of it, and, which it is, you know. And, and then they can use eminent domain to go in there and acquire the remaining properties and now they're building a big, you know, kind of research, genetic research kind of institute on top of it. Now they've been doing this for 20 years. And I think that, that the, the process of dispossession uh, the, 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 the legal piece at the end of it is, it seems to me, comes um, as a, a kind of a, a confirmation of something that's been going on uh, by other means. And when uh, the community there has been basically destroyed by this practice of buying up housing and leaving, it, leaving them empty, when it's been destroyed and everything has been destroyed, then it, it would seem to me, well, eminent domain, yeah, you probably should take it over and do that because what, you know, it, it, it has gone. But the process of destruction that has gone on before that uh, is something that needs uh, very clearly to, to, to be looked at. Uh, perfectly so. I mean, when the land or any resource that is the life supporting resource uh, matrix uh, in the hands of the so called poor who are indeed rich in that resource, and hence the grabbing takes place, it is seen in the rural communities as well as the urban areas. In the city like Mumbai, for example, the 60% of population lives in what are known as slums, the horizontal slums and the vertical slums together. And they have in their possession in a way, although without payment, but let's say with some accessibility, uh, affordability doesn't come into picture because the market is neither theirs uh, nor anyone else's as long as they are living on the land. But only 6% of land they are occupying. And even that is taken over. The builders and the contractors who are in nexus with the legislators, the rulers, the ministers and the bureaucrats uh, have the designs, the perfectly legitimate designs because they uh, make the policies and they change the policies overnight and of course they are not alone. The World Bank comes in and changes the whole landscape by bringing in one kind of infrastructure that fulfills the agenda of the car industry, occupies huge amount of land for the highways and flyovers because each car needs the land to be reserved at three places, at home, at office, on the road. And hence that is at the cost of even the simple, affordable, self-reliant housing by the poor who are rich in, even in their human labor. Who are the construction workers, building the cities, running the cities, cleaning the cities. But they do not have the right to sleep with a small piece of land of their own. So they become illegal at the night time while they are legal citizens, legal voters, 
legal laborers as we always say so we have challenged all this because in 2004 75,000 houses were demolished and the urban poor in Paris or urban poor in Brazil or urban poor in Cape Town and uh, other cities of uh, South Africa. We have seen their struggles. We have come together at some fora as we did in the case of the anti large dam movements. And we realized that this phenomenon is all over. But here in Mumbai when this happened, we decided to with slogan and with commitment, not just a slogan. Uh, save the houses and build the houses and others houses we have been building anyway but why not our own when we belong to 96 percent of that working class in India which doesn't have even the minimum of social security at the end of the working life when we have no bank balance the only thing that we can live upon is the resource base in our own hands which is as i said land for the right to shelter assertion and our own human labor which is the greatest inevitable capital so we challenged not just eviction of slums which we did by reoccupying the land rebuilding the houses overnight when the bombay was flooded you might have heard of that all indians do not forget it now every city is getting flooded because the destructive ways of managing the resources that is not of those who put the least of the burden on the society and the state but of the others who are only consumerist and who only want to devour the resources in both ways by accumulation and by destruction and that leads to displacement and that leads to the vulgar kind of disparities so this disparity is to be questioned we thought that we would not only oppose eviction and rebuild and regenerate the living communities beyond caste and creed which to us look not ugly but beautiful but we would also challenge the builders and the contractors for whom the land is granted on lease at the rate of 40 paisa per acre so on and so forth so we expose that scam and scandal the 2G spectrum scandal is in the air here it is the land spectrum scandal and hence we questioned them we took them pulled them into the courts but never did we go to the courts so easily unless we had a perseverant and long struggle on the streets or wherever now the enclosures are provided nowadays that's it but we always occupy the ministries and we also climb up to the fourth minister floor of the ministry or we keep the gates closed as we did it on the 28th and confidentially we are going to do it on the 2nd of May. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, and then they have to come down somewhere little bit for a temporary period at least down to earth and then some builder like the Hiranandani Indians know them maybe is exposed because on paper it is the houses for the poor extra land above ceiling when the act existed now all this urban ceiling acts in India one state after another are withdrawn to release the land they said you know it's like uh, to bring back the democracy in Iraq <laughs> that fake it is it is this still the land 30,000 acres in the hands of a handful less than even 69 the number and they are still occupying that while the state lawfully also could have taken it into their hands spending only a few hundred thousand rupees but that not happening we have exposed it saying the Shah Rukh Khan's bangla also is on paper the houses for the poor only thing he has done is the great work demolishing walls so that all the poor people's houses is converted inside into Shah Rukh Khan's bungalow. <laughs> when we went to the court, the court said you are for the publicity drive. My immediate colleague in whose name the case was filed by the National Alliance of People's Movements to whom Sanjay Bhai who has brought me here also belongs. And uh, the court said that you are to pay a fine of 20,000 rupees. Why? Because this is publicity mongering. You are doing it as public interest, not public interest, but publicity interest litigation. Rather, the court should be a fan of Shah Rukh Khan, but nothing less than that. So we have to fight these battles. 
we could stop many of the builders where the layman brothers is involved it is easier to stop them although the layman brothers collapses the enron collapses on its own weightage or burden but when we can show this linkage it is better it's easier not only to convince the crowd and the millions in india but at least to show that there is some fictitious vested interest which is the real reason behind this kind of lawful occupation of land so we are continuing with that one builder after another facing the police and then erecting the new forum called as people's parliament you can see in the two photographs thousands of the urban poor to also the middle class whose cooperative societies are also now getting manipulated so everyone is in the queue it started maybe with the indigenous communities then the dalits who were on the periphery of the rural areas now they are on the periphery of the urban areas so who are the people in these so called slums living in human existence or below subsistence level uh, they are the real builders they are the real contributors and their rights not just legal rights because laws can be changed overnight world bank has changed the water policy has brought in the enactment where industrial um, uh, requirements are above the agricultural requirements the priorities have changed so on and so forth so human rights are above legal rights is the assertion and the action revolves around it um the picture that you paint meda is one where um <coughs> the Uh, aggression of the state and the corporate sector is reached to such a proportion that it's it's naked that it's that it's so visible that the it's crude it's visible it's uh, you know that there's there's nothing that masks it anymore and in that sense um it would i would argue that uh, we are in a situation where the politics of transformation the politics of some kind of radical change is in 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 that sense in minute i know that for uh, when we when we are actually working on the ground etc we not, may not feel that every moment that somehow something dramatic is going to happen and change in the next few years but everything about it it seems like things have been driven to their limit in a certain way and i want to kind of pick on a theme that david also kind of pointed to that is uh, that that capital seems to be running into a certain set of limits that it doesn't quite know how to negotiate and so the bourgeoisie in david's words has this kind of dream or a vision of settling down as rentiers of one sort or another um so in india if i can start with meda this time and then go to david you know i mean what is your sense of this limits are 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 we at a certain i mean it's like the latin american experience was one wherein neoliberalism starts there a few uh, let's say around a decade or so before it really hits places like south asia and the transformations come in latin america around 8 10 years ago uh, 12 years ago is when that transformation begins to happen in the very same way do you see some limits being hit in india do you see social movements um being coming together napm is now a 15 Twelve to fifteen-year-old experiment. The People's Parliament is a new form that you are bringing into place. Do you see a new set of things beginning to happen? That's one. And to David, I mean, a more global reflection also on the same kind of thematic. See, I think uh, one would like to say enough is enough. <laughs> But whenever I utter that phrase, I remember we had said so in Madrid. Uh, at the 50th anniversary of the Bretton Woods institution <laughs> saying enough is enough <laughs> and the declaration was in the name of the village community in the Narmada valley that community is still there on its own land the dam is still stopped but any time with the sword hanging <laughs> it can fall upon the rest of the people 200000 in the submerged area of the one single dam so uh, both ways <laughs> the struggle continues has sustained itself has made its impact and not only the violent armed struggle as i would like always to underline because no doubt they shake the state to an extent 
but the perseverant, long, non-violent battles which take in the struggles <coughs> as well as the reconstruction, the reconstructive activities, whether building the alternative power projects and the water projects or bringing in the uh, new theorization of uh, living with the resources which was of Gandhi's, which was of Marx, so on and so forth. But of the communities themselves, and there is nothing to be afraid of communities, I suppose. Although their face is also changing, the market making a dent, and the state uh, dividing them, ruling them, killing them. In the name of caste and religion it used to happen, now it is in the name of development and progress. And yet, we see a spirit a seed, a piece of land lying there in the communities. And hence uh, these, the units of democratic planning, which shouldn't be taken as a last unit. Gandhiji said it, Antyodaya, we would call it Prathamodaya. If he was alive today, he would have called it the same way, I suppose. Because they are not the last, not the least, but the first and the foremost unit of not just planning with the resources, but visualizing the future, depicting the vision, and then setting the goals within the value frameworks, <coughs> not valuations in the market terms. And that is what one should start with, is our idea of transformation. What is happening, whether in India and in some states, and it may happen if the five states election results are out within few days or even in Bolivia to say the least is the transfer of power. Now who is to be empowered that would be defined through the action by the electoral political power holders and that action is in which framework of vision of goals of strategies of choices of technology, of choices of the selected democratic processes. That would decide whether it is transformation or not. And that's why we were just discussing informally. Whether in Bolivia, the water management is completely changed when they have asserted their right to oil and gas, which India hasn't, Indian people hasn't been able to. So that people's sovereignty over resources and planning with those resources is something that is to define whether we have transformed our polity, our economy, our, uh, our lifestyles, our uh, ecosystems and so on. So we are not for status quo, we don't want. Now the movements are in all of this. Now that may appear to be a mess. Many people say, oh, why have you gone away from the anti dam movement? We have not gone away from the anti dam movement. We are both in the legal and the grassroots uh, water uh, battles. But the war is not yet won. While 165 dams in Narmada Valley on one hand, most of them, the giant ones are stopped from filling the water or raising the height. And the people are holding on. The swords are hanging and 168 dams in the Brahmaputra Valley are taking over. The World Bank was learning a lesson but they were never good students as we always call them. So it is that and yet now the dams were symbols of paradigm and there are so many symbols so we cannot remain only symbolic by raising one issue. The issue based movements matter but beyond issue based movements the alliance of coming together just as you had that great alliance of the labor force which came to the streets and stayed on the streets. Now maybe you have not won the battle on the budget cuts or whatever. For us the budget is not even known. It is only discussed with the confederation of industries. So there is no way pre-budget battle can take place. It's only the post facto. But all these alliance efforts, not just experiments, also give us a lot of strength. And if that is the non-electoral people's politics, then that is not only trying to grab against their land grab some seed grabs. It's too small to grab their seeds. We have to draw a longer line to make them shorter. Vinobhaji, the disciple of and the colleague of Mahatma Gandhi had said it. The state must 
not totally wither away maybe the Maoists would say that we are somewhere in between you can say it but the state must be limited and its occupation, dispossession, its designs, its commodification, its nexus building and its killing oppressive and repressive brutal ways the state violence should be all shown its own space or not left any space for so creating the new political economic spaces this new people's politics which is beyond elections or outside elections as you may call it but not a political mm -hmm. watching the election politics very 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 closely intervening and if we fail in that we fail because we should know what are their designs to occupy political power and not just to occupy lands so in all of that i think the movements are growing i must say that we have not reached our goal obviously that's why we have a lot of uh, uh, reason to be very very humble but the civil society as it is normally called now i make a difference between the ngos and people's movements as we do it in india yeah. similarly civil society and the mobilized organized masses but now beyond the dalits and the peripheralized and marginalized masses the so called common middle class also is coming forward now whether it is through the wikipedia and the google and the <laughs> twitter and uh, facebook it's mind boggling for all of us <laughs> i said it yesterday i said it day before after coming here i came to know and it's truthfully saying that there is a facebook in my name and when i saw that i saw that there are so many not just praises allegations now who would counter those it's faceless so i have no space in a very real sense on the facebook so there are ways and ways of mobilizing that are coming in so everything is so fast changing in the anna hazar is fast which many of you might have monitored you know along with the free vinayak sen campaign you might have monitored this free india campaign of corruption anti corruption and uh, there were various categories of people coming there mm -hmm. some were really genuine one blind person had walked down from dehradun i spoke to each of the 200 fasting persons who were sitting around and i cannot express to you my feeling they were maybe not on those forty channels but they were very very genuine as genuine as anna jarej their fast had to be broken by giving three sips of the one pack lemon water <laughs> and uh, but they were there another category was of the people who belong to the people's organizations movements who thought this would be a real breakthrough and are still thinking uh, we are now sitting together to see look back and look forward on the 8th of may in delhi but there was also the third category who had come with more or less genuine interest and one cannot say they are not committed but they also looked at it as a celebration they also looked at it as liberation they also looked at it as whatever you know so now uh, how do you look at this in a way the movements not necessarily global immediately but at least should be national we all dream of that we cannot put our photographs with the posters here i can you know <laughs> take some liberty to do that but here in india i cannot put my posters the politics of that kind is not acceptable to us then how to reach out to a such huge largest democracy in the world is a real question so the moments have not yet had their full space full impact the challenge is too much we fall short on many terms you don't join us so we fall short and we need lot of support from all the corners when lavasa city is stopped we want to catch each of the investors which is not only our agriculture minister but also oxford university down here so or up here you have to then dig out that information at least whatever tools whosoever has whether in india or abroad if you use those as the weapons or the tools whatever and then we connect as we did in the narmada struggle when we had to drive the world bank out one or two agencies and i had not even come out of india then for the first time they came out i found 10 organizations 
and only the strategizing worked i think we suggested that act as a nodal agency in your country and you ask where your money is going whether it is yen or mark or dollar and that paid the result that got the answers to them that time we did not get now we have right to information act so different tools different weapons changing redrafting the policies but also the strategization that is the strength of the movements along with the mass empowerment mass power and the vision of the masses to be truly reflected in struggle and reconstruction we look at the people's parliament as one of the exercises uh, unless we are together without egos and super egos of our own and in the alliance and we are political but we also look at the power and power holders in a different sense we will not win the battle <laughs> Yeah, one of my <coughs> favorite quotes from uh, Marx is that the state is the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. Now, it's not always the case, uh, as we see in Bolivia, but frankly, uh, it struck me a lot over the last uh, 30 years in particular, the state has more and more become the executive committee of the bourgeoisie almost everywhere around the world. And, and uh, so, you not only have to do battle with capital, but you have to do battle with the state. Uh, and that, and, and even uh, the law, I mean, your comments about, you know, the courts. Uh, and we see in this country how the Supreme Court belongs to the right wing, and increasingly, I guess, in India, it's the same. Uh, and, and so, all of these institutions have been, in effect, robbed, if you want to call it that, taken away from uh, real democracy and from uh, the impact of the people and they've become isolated so that you could, don't see the budget, you don't see any of these kinds of things. <laughs> so, if that, but then there's an interesting kind of question is how did, how did that actually come about and, 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 and by what means? Uh, did this this occur and I think that that all comes back to the whole kind of strategy of neoliberalization which set in uh, around the 1970s I mean the answer to the crisis of the 1970s could have gone all sorts of different ways but the way that emerged was indeed ne neoliberalization with Reagan, Thatcher, Pinochet, all these people putting this forward now it's an interesting thing uh, uh, that what that was really about and the way I would put it is this that there are two kinds of costs that capital does not want to bear or have anything to do with one set of costs have to do with environmental degradation so what you try to do in the, in the economist terms is you try to turn them into externalities i.e. they're real costs but somebody else has to deal with them not not capital uh, the other set of costs uh, are what I call costs of social reproduction, uh, which are, you know, who cares for the sick and the maimed and, and, and the impoverished and, 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 and the like. And capital doesn't want to deal with those either. Now, historically, of course, social democratic movements, particularly in the advanced capitalist world in North America and Europe, uh, pushed the state to start to internalize some of those costs so that you had in the 1970s in this country you had something like the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency and so on which was forcing and you know environmental impact statements and you started it was a real push to force capital to internalize some of the environmental costs. The same thing was happening cost of social reproduction, you know, welfare, legislation, affordable housing, all those kinds of issues were pushed in the 1960s. And, and, and so some of those costs were being internalized. And what neoliberalization was about was forcing the externalization of those costs by taking over the state and making sure the state was going to uh, get, you know, help get out of it. Now, th the strategy was very, very interesting. Uh, what Reagan did in this country, and this is a sort of paradigm case, I mean Reagan came to power and the first thing he did was to reduce the top tax rate in this country from 72 percent to 30 percent. Huge tax cut for the rich. The second thing he did was he launched a, a, a huge kind of uh, arms race with the Soviet Union, which was debt financed. 
And as a result of that, the debt under Reagan, a Republican, soared. And towards the end of Reagan's presidency, his budget director said, and this was probably, you know, they have these rare moments of honesty, in which he said, well, our strategy was to so increase the debt that that then gave us an excuse to go after all of the environmental regulations and all of the social, re social legislation we don't like. Okay. So this was, this was the strategy. What did Bush Jr. do? He cut the tax rates on the rich. He, f he fought two unfunded wars, which were heavily debt financed, and he gave a, a huge giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry. And the result of that was the debt under a Republican went like this. Now the Republicans claim the debt has become so serious that what do we have to do? We have to get rid of all of the environmental regulations and we have to uh, actually externalize all of those social reproduction costs. And this is exactly what you know, the Republican governors are doing right now is to get, get you know, the state out of this. Now this has been a strategy. And you see this in Britain with Cameron now, he didn't run up the debt in the same way, it's just that the debt is there. And the crisis, you know, one of the important things is you never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> and the crisis this time has, has given the whole of North America and Europe the excuse to in, insert a politics of austerity. Look what's happening to Greece, look what's happening to Portugal. The standard of living is, is going down like that. Ireland is going down like that. Now this is a strategy which was also exported internationally in the 1980s with the International Monetary Fund in particular. It's called Structural Adjustment. And the, one of the big first episodes of this was the Mexican debt crisis of 1982. Mexico was going into debt and couldn't pay debt back. Who had lent it the money? The New York investment bankers. If Mexico defaulted, the New York bankers would have gone under. So the United States and the IMF bailed out Mexico. As they bailed them out and gave them the money so they didn't go bankrupt, they then kind of said, well, you have to implement austerity. So the standard of living of people in Mexico declined by about 25% in the following five years. This was a strategy. And guess what? You then kind of said, well, you know, privatization, get rid of all of that kind of stuff, blah, 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 insert, insert neoliberal politics into here. And guess what? Mexico now has more billionaires than, than Saudi Arabia. I mean, you know, India too. I mean, this is, this is what it's, it's a politics of what you might call the plutocracy. There's a global plutocracy out there. There's probably about 400 families that probably control about, you know, half of the world's wealth right now. And it's a, and it's a global plutocracy. And what they're doing in this crisis is making sure they don't get hurt. Everybody else can get hurt, but they're, they're doing okay. That's why I'm kind of talking about this land grab stuff, you know, because they're, they're, they're partly, partly into that. Now, as background to this, there is something else which I think is very crucial to put into the picture. Capital is a growth machine. It has to grow or die. It's committed to a minimum of 3% compound growth forever. Now, 3% compound growth in, say, 1850 was one thing. You're looking at 3% compound growth now for the next 100 years. You're looking at something that is really horrendous to think about. Right now, if you want 3% growth right now, you have to find new profitable investment uh, opportunities for $1.5 trillion. In 20 years' time, you'd have to find profitable investment opportunities for $3 trillion. It's a geometric you know, kind of thing. I think we've been running into difficulties finding those profitable outlets. So one of the things you start to do is instead of investing in making things, you invest in possessing things. Which is why under neoliberalization, what you have is, is an, an acceleration of this politics of accumulation by dispossession. Which means that there's going to be even more pressure on the poor and the disadvantaged. And this is what's going on, you know, with Cameron in Britain. It's what's going on in terms of Republican politics here. It's what's going on throughout of all of Europe. This is what Angela Merkel is pushing on Greek, Greece and pushing on Portugal and all the rest of it. And it's not only a dispossession of, of things, it's also a dispossession of rights. You know, pension rights, health care rights. Housing used to be a right, it no longer is. And so what you get is a, is, 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 is a dynamic in the global economy, 
which is headed in that direction. Now, my argument would be that we have to think at some point or other towards a zero growth economy, which is not the same as a zero development economy. I think human development, human capacity, the development of human capacities and powers is one kind of way to think about what we should be thinking about in the future. But that doesn't have to be about necessarily growth forever, 3% compound growth forever. And th if 3% compound growth forever is what capital is about, and if we can't live with 3% compound growth, we've got to learn to live without capital. Mm -hmm. That is, you have to start to think about an anti-capitalist organization, an anti-capitalist politics. And it's very difficult to get people to think in these terms. I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, because what we're told is the solution to the environmental problems and the solution to the social pov problems of poverty. Look at the Millennium Goals, which everybody signed on to in the United Nations. Global poverty will be gone in 15 years. The environment will be saved in 15 years. Look where we are now. <laughs> and uh, this is ridiculous. And, but the problem is that you're supposed to solve those problems by the very means that created the problems in the first place. I.e., we're told the only way you can solve these problems is by doing what the World Bank and the IMF say you have to do, which is get the market going, do all this kind of stuff. It's going to be solved, you know, by De Soto giving property rights to everybody and all this kind of stuff. It's going to be solved by more of capitalism. It's, 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 it's an incredible contradiction. It's crazy. And I keep saying to people who are in these anti-poverty organizations, we have a lot of them in this country, I said, you're in the wrong organization. <laughs> you should be in an anti-wealth organization. <laughs> Because you can't solve the problems of global poverty without solving the problems of global accumulation of wealth. You can't do it without actually destroying the plutocracy and the power of the plutocracy. And that is what has to be, be done on a global scale. And one of the things I think is remarkable right now is precisely what you were talking about, that, that, that you know, you have some sort of uh, empathy, if you like, but also contact with you know, what's going on in South Africa, what's going on in Latin America, what's going on elsewhere. And, and I think people are beginning to realize that actually it's going to take a global movement of this kind to really do something of this sort. And, you know, I, I have a, my daughter put me on Facebook and I can't, figure out <laughs> I can't figure out how to get on there. So if the revolution occurs by Facebook, I'm going to be late. <laughs> But Very quickly. <laughs> okay, I let me do that. To this, maybe. Uh, what David has been saying, uh, I just have some reflections from what is happening in India, is that uh, all these um, innovative strategies uh, of taking over, which are the new imperial, new liberal, new colonial, the way you would like to describe those, um, are looked forward to and rather adopted within the countries uh, who are made to stand in the queue, begging for the same model of development. Uh, developing countries, <laughs> that's how they are questioned by many scientists within India and the third world. Uh, but that is where uh, we are more cautious. And hence, while uh, we know that their deregulation, deinvestment is not just taking over the public sector or handing over to the private sector, but they are uh, also privatizing the commons. So the community vis-a-vis -vis the state also has no primacy, very little space, if at all, in spite of those being called local self-government in our constitution. And hence, while we may not be up against polity per se, we are questioning the present form of the polity. Just as we are questioning the present form of economy, which is uh, ruling based on the vulgar inequities leading to injustice unacceptable. So while questioning this polity, we are questioning the statism. Because the state is no more a welfare state even. While we would not like them to do charity, we would like them not only to govern, we would like them to be an uh, enabling force for the democratic uh, decision making and management of resources. Management again is not a good word, but harnessing of resources. So, uh, while the state is not playing that role, we cannot anymore just look forward to the state also as uh, the real form and the uh, channel. And hence, neither statist 
nor the corporatist or marketist. We want that form of the popular cooperation, sharing to the joint kind of decision making, sharing of resources to sharing of benefits after harnessing those resources. And there the principles of self-reliance would really be at the focus because that would be based on self-determination on one hand, rights to resources on one hand and also beyond right to resources, the human rights to life, to livelihood, to cultural diversity, to biodiversity and so on. So uh, if that cooperation is partly existing in the form of the communities, whichever part of the world those still exist with some dent made etc etc some heterogeneity Dalits are not necessarily still the mainstream community everywhere but more manageable more changeable more transformable and so whether it is in the form of the community level unit of cooperation or something created by the human society like or changing the United Nations and at the global that is international level having one vote equal dignity based forum which is not permitted to be uh, entered by and influenced by the corporates we have to think of these new forms of institutions which are forms of political consciousness but which are also forms of um, you know the self governments and uh, using the resources no doubt we would not say don't touch the forest don't touch the rivers that kind of conservation which cannot even be intergenerational is something that uh, we should avoid but at the same time the socio eco eco the social economic and ecological and together it will be political because that will define the relationships the relationships between the power and the people, the relationship between no billionaires, maybe no large corporates, but between those who have industrial production and distribution at the heart of their activities and contribution and others who have the agricultural or natural resource based and playing the complementary role, not killing one for the other and so on. So that has to be the vision which may sound utopian at this point of time but all our ideals are utopian we still carry those so uh, <clears throat> several themes coming up uh, in the last two or three responses from David and Mehta and I want to kind of pick a few out and uh, toss it back at uh, them and you can respond to any part of the few things that I'll bring up and this is oh, um, an original format was that this conversation would go on for a bit and then we'd break and then Meda would uh, actually give a talk but Meda suggested to me that we keep this conversation going this way and, we can so, also and then after around 15 minutes more we can then open it up for Q&A so uh, there's much talk of a new vision there's much talk about uh, envisioning a new world um, uh, Meda has uh, drawn up the axes of uh, um, along lines of how to recreate a different economy, how to think about uh, about ecology. Uh, David's uh, talked about a zero growth economy. Now, let me flip it to say that in all of this, it involves a particular change of consciousness in people. Right? Without the change of consciousness, the quote unquote revolution is not there. And part of the problem, and I'll frame two different problems. In India, what I do see, and Medaji can intervene to say how right or wrong I am about this, what I do see is that there is a particular kind of consciousness that exists uh, across much of the rural sector and in certain small pockets of the urban sector in terms of knowing that this life and the particular way in which the state behaves with them and the corporate sector behaves with them is definitely what they don't want right that clarity is there in large segments and in a certain sense that's what you're building on um, in the west and increasingly now in places like india and i'm saying the timeline is very short uh, even in places like india there is the, i mean around a 40 or 50 year stretch in a hyper market consumerist mode 
has produced a particular kind of subjectivity, which I want to ask, you know, how, how do you, I mean, what is the nature of the struggle around these questions of subjectivity? Uh, the the, uh, the hyper-utilitarian kind of, you know, me, me, me first. You know, when Reagan said, um, what is being done to your tax dollars? I don't think anybody in the United States 50 years ago would have used the notion of my tax dollars, right? That, that whole transformation of certain things belong only and only to you, right? And that kind of hyper-utilitarianism, that kind of hyper me, 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 the uh, subject position is kind of becoming big even in India. I mean, I see younger people kind of having no choice but to respond to that, right? In, in, in youth spaces, even in middle class or low middle class, uh, even working class youth spaces, I see them, you know, just saying, I don't think I have a choice but to cut somebody else's throat and get ahead, right? So this whole subjectivity, how would we, you know, where do the answers lie? You know, what kind of, you know, uh, uh, Medha mentioned, you know, in, in, in that triumvirate of uh, Marx, Gandhi and Ambedkar, you know, where would we look? Or not, not necessarily, we don't have to necessarily look there, but I'm saying, you know, what, where, where is the thinking around this happening is the broad question I'm framing. And either of you can go. You see, the uh, privatization of this kind, where the citizens who are human beings, and human beings are considered to be uh, the social animals. <laughs> animals we are, but social. <laughs> and that characteristic getting lost or reduced to the minimally influential factor and force in the lives is worse than even the corporate privatization. Uh, no doubt about it. And uh, what this world which is going towards more and more of marketization and commodification is doing is exactly this. Uh, looking not back, not forward, but to yourself, within yourself, is something through career, through contracts, through um, calculations, what not, corruption, uh, communalism, uh, criminalization, all of those are the ways and means through which this is uh, imbibed, inculcated in the name of identity sometimes where even that minimum understanding of the dignity of each other gets lost. <laughs> that is what is happening to the whole of the society and it goes beyond the nation states, it goes beyond those small little communities, no doubt. And hence the revivalism again, that also is sometimes taking a dangerous turn. <laughs> you know the Bharatiya Swabhiman, no doubt, but Will that be again the fundamentalist way of asserting your identity at the cost of others? The regionalism where you have to assert your rights for employment maybe in the city like Mumbai. But then that you do by attacking the taxi drivers not in New York but there in <laughs> Mumbai and the Pani Puriwalas and so on. Whether, you know, using any opportunity to do this is a real assertion of rights? No. Is it real empowerment through the right kind of identities? No. On one hand, the struggles of the indigenous people, of the uh, Dalits, the so-called lower caste or the minorities or those based on the and for the gender justice are for identity. But unless that is within this understanding of the dignity of human beings, it is uh, not the struggle for survival of anyone. Rather, it is dividing and killing each other. <laughs> Ultimately, it is going to be that. So this needs to be questioned. And hence, although the movements cannot take that grand spiritual turn or terms, uh, somewhere in the spirit of the moment, I think this needs to be understood and peacefully thought of. Mm. Because otherwise you deal with corruption, one scam, Adarsha we exposed, we exposed Lavasa, we exposed Iranandani, someone has exposed Uji Spectrum and everything and everyone. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the whole greed that cannot be fulfilled, which Mahatma Ji uh, said it in one sentence, if you have to fulfill the needs, 
you cannot accept the greed that is what should have been the next sentence and uh, that is something which is again and again reviving the same and worsening the situation so where do we finally find ourselves we have to therefore be in struggles in exposing and questioning and challenging and we also have to be in reconstruction small little work of the jeevan shalas the life schools mm -hmm. that uh, second set of posters we are trying to do that make the children from the first learner generation in the adivasi communities and you feel you are also sowing the seed you are not just saying don't grab the land don't grab the land how long will you go on saying it so somewhere uh, save the land and sow the seeds is uh, necessary i would also say that uh, to cut across these uh, boundary walls the new boundary walls that are created with this kinds of career consciousness to the market consciousness amongst the youths and the new generation is to be done consciously and with effective strategies so that is where the attraction of the glitter and the facebook comes in probably you know <laughs> the people who gathered at the gateway of india after the terrorist attack on the taj hotel came through sms and probably the movements in egypt or libya also have that contribution so where do you really uh, see the kind of internal mobilization that would also go on along with the external mobilization and how to get even that small core may not call it a cadre but small core at the moment which are not only outsidely trained and we all fall short in all these exercises which are dreamt of uh, mind you but then innovative media the alternative media creating and grabbing again uh, some space within the mainstream media all of these uh, strategic mix and again fighting from the local to global the multiple multiple front strategies all are the big challenges before us and the timeline is short you uh, warn me again uh, and i'm thankful to that i have to rush back to india today cannot stay out because jairam ramesh is to visit the narmada valley and has cheated us and we have to fight it and within two months the sardar sarovar decision to complete the dam is going to be taken they have already announced it and so on and so forth so micro to macro on one hand local to global on the other hand mainstream to alternative on the other hand the downtrodden to the wider society on the third hand the legal to the ground level battle so on and so forth wonderful <laughs> it's a let's, great uh, challenge and we have to be humble <laughs> let's toss it back at david yeah the uh, what i um try to do in uh, the enigma of capital book for example was to give an outline of how social change occurs based on my reading of marx and as i saw it uh, he talks about the way in which there is no sort of single way in which change occurs it has to be a change across many different dimensions and there are seven dimensions or spheres that i call them which need to be thought about uh, the first is transformations in, our, in the relation to nature. Uh, the second sphere would be the sphere of technologies and organizational forms. Uh, the third would be the form of social relations which exist in a, in a social situation. The fourth would be changing uh, production structures, both in terms of what is produced and how it is produced. Uh, the fifth is changes in daily life and 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 reproduction processes uh, the sixth is institutional uh, arrangements which would include questions of law and all the rest of it and the seventh would be mental conceptions of the world now one of the things that you see in social theory is a tendency to take any one of those and say that is the silver bullet that will change everything uh, just change mental conceptions of the world and everything will work. Uh, you read somebody like Paul Hawken and he kind of says, well, change your daily life and everything else will change. 
the classic Marxian view was you change the technologies and the productive forces and everything else falls into place. Uh, revolutionary feminists and, uh, and, and uh, ecologists say change, you know, social relations. And, but uh, what Marx does is to give a very interesting account of how capitalism came out of feudalism that it took changes along all of those dimensions, sometimes supportive of each other, sometimes antagonistic, a movement across all of that. So a political movement of real transformation has to grasp all of those elements and try to move collectively across all of them. And if you look at what happened with neoliberalism, actually it did that when you look back at that history. Look at what it did to institutional forms and organizational uh, and, and, and technologies and organizational forms. Look what it did to the world of production. Look at what it did in terms of social relations. And indeed, Margaret Thatcher said, my, my aim is not simply to change the economy, but to change people's mental conceptions of the world. That is why that would be the great thing to do. And she did it. And you're now talking about a situation where, you know, 30 years later, we're all neoliberal. We don't really know how to think differently. It was not we didn't think that way in 1970. The technologies were very different in 1970. We didn't have Facebook and Twitter. We didn't even have a photocopying machine. I mean, people kind of say, what? <laughs> how, how did you live, you know? Well, it was, uh, it, so, and, and daily life was, was, was very different. But I think also the no nature of social relations. There were many more collective solidarities around in 1970 than there are today. One of the missions of neoliberalism was to destroy all of those forms, I mean, unions and all those other, other, other forms. So, so you have to think about that, but the mental, cons you know, and so I, th I think uh, the social change is occurring by all of us collectively thinking about what can I really contribute to. Now, I'm not good at technologies, like I say, I don't know how to get on Facebook and all that kind of thing. But I can uh, do something on mental conceptions, and so I, I, but I know that what I do is not going to change the world unless daily life also changes, unless all these other elements also change. So, so ha but, but those changes occur rather slowly. Uh, and, and you know, when you look back and you kind of say, well, how, how did that transformation occur through the 1970s and 1980s so that we started to think radically differently about how the world is made and, what it, and, and, and how we should be in it? How did, how did that really occur? And, but I think the issue right now is there seems to be no general strategy from the standpoint of the bourgeoisie. Uh, there's not a radical new strategy emerging. I mean, the 1930s gave us sort of Keynesianism and it gave us, uh, you know, kind of some notions of social solidarity, a new economic and social theory, a new positioning of what the state apparatus should be about. The 1970s did the same, even though it took it in a direction which I think is horrendous, but it did the same. But we don't have an alternative, the, the bourgeoisie does not have an alternative model right now, except to sort of try and find an arc in which it's going to sort of sit and, and hope to ride out, you know, the storm. That's why I'm saying that a lot of them are so much into this business of becoming rentiers, uh, because they can't think of anywhere else to go or anything else really productive to do. So this is a moment where there can be the possibility of, of, of change, but it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, and, and, and the big difficulty, one of the big difficulties I find in the, in the sphere I'm in, which is about you know, people's mental conceptions of the world, is that we have a huge structure of, of research universities that are completely oriented to the maintenance of the status quo. And, and therefore there's a battle to be fought <coughs> inside of the knowledge production industries, you want to call it that, a huge battle to be fought. And, uh, and for me, this is, this is one where there's a good deal, of course, of prejudice against you. I cannot get reviewed or published in any mainstream uh, mm -hmm. journal or in this, in this country. I had, a, I had an argument with Katrina van der Hervel the other day saying, how come the nation doesn't take seriously anything I do? <laughs> and you're supposed to be a radical journal. Oh, no, we do take seriously what you do. No, no, no. to hell she did, you know. I mean, it's... So, so th th there's a problem. But it, this is not true in Britain. In Britain, you can get through. I mean, I get on the BBC and I go, you know, and I can, I can get in, you know, I've just been asked to write a... Uh, a, a sort of op-ed piece for the Independent on, on, on the significance of May Day, so I kind of said, well, we should just start the revolution next, you know, May 1st, you know. <laughs> so, so it's not true everywhere, and, 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 and so there is a, 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 tremen a tremendous struggle to be, to be, to be fought uh, in, in mainstream academia. 
uh, where, where, you know, we're caught between, you know, sort of a vicious end game of the neoliberal thing or, or Keynesian nostalgia. Uh, and, you know, somebody like Paul Krugman seems to me very much into the kind of realm of, of, of Keynesian nostalgia. And, and uh, you know, and I, I, I prefer Keynesian nostalgia to vicious neoliberalism, to be true, to be sure, but on the other hand, that's not going to help it either. <laughs> no. So where are the alternatives going to come from? And, and so then it's about, it's, then it's about thinking and, 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 and trying to educate people more into these sorts of things. And, you know, the left hasn't done a very good job, frankly. I mean, we have a lot of revolutionaries on the left who produce literature that is completely incomprehensible. <laughs> And I've done some of that myself, I confess. <laughs> so, so I've been trying to mend my ways recently and write stuff that people can understand. And it's, it's kind of very interesting. People say, oh, I can finally understand what the hell you're talking about. You know, so, it, it, so and, and in this, by the way, I think the, 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 the Marx course on the online has been very, very significant. And, 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 and so, the, the, but, but, you know, I'm only one person. I need a lot of allies, <laughs> you know. You need to build, build a, a bit of a more of a consensus within academia to build these alternatives. But I recognize also that if there are not changes in daily life and there aren't changes in organizational forms and institutional arrangements, that, that we're not going to have a revolutionary transformation. We need to have a movement that goes across all of those elements. And so, uh, you know, and I think that if we're aware of that, then we can actually start to think of building coalitions you know, of people who do think about, you know, alternative technologies and organizational forms, who do think about, you know, reorganization of production, who do think about what happens when workers take control of their own factories and, 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 and how things can get coordinated through solidarity economies and so on. So there's a lot of alternative thinking going on. So it's a matter of putting a lot of that together in a, in a rather different configuration. So I have to say I find it inspirational what you're saying. I mean, I think it's fantastic that these things from your perspective and from where you're coming from are going on. In, in, in particular ways they're going and I can learn from that and I hope that I'll be a, a better learner than the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> i just add to this. What I'll do is just ask a last question so you can tag on what you want to say and also then have both of your responses and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, which is, um, I, I mean, after watching the uh, changes in the Middle East, uh, everybody is suddenly worried about being on Facebook or Twitter. And I assure you that the role that those played there is very minimal. So I think both of you will make it to the revolution. And I personally am booking a flight to London tomorrow so that I can be there on May Day when the revolution actually begins. So, <laughs> um, uh, very quickly, <clears throat> let me turn it to the one thing that we really haven't uh, spoken about to that uh, to to, uh, to any significant degree, which is the question of ecology. And I want to kind of tie it to the question of resources. Right? I mean, resource rights, struggles around resources, extractive industry, extraction, accelerated rates of extraction, which is the other end of neoliberalism, wherein, you know, in a, in a, in a place like India, what, what you're seeing right now is just dig, yank it out, and sell it in the world market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even matter as to whether it is of uh, you know uh, wh whether it can be used within the with, with, within the territorial boundaries of the nation state uh, in a more productive fashion, right? It's just yank it out, sell it in the world market, and the state and the bourgeoisie in, is in such a collusion that the rates, the royalty rates you get on it, are you know amazing. I've been working very significantly on the solidarity for one particular struggle, the POSCO struggle uh, in India that's going on, which is the Pohang Steel Company. And I'm absolutely convinced that the specific structure of what they're asking from the Indian state, which is a captive set of mines, uh, a captive private port, nine kilometers south of one of India's largest ports, and a quote-unquote steel plant. While the steel, steel plant is there, I'm absolutely convinced that the reason why the private port is so important is for smuggling the sh shit out. Right? I mean, it's, it's really, really uh, important. So, I mean, this rapid rate, accelerated rate of extraction, notions of rights over resources, you know, I, I want to connect it to that and broadly ask the question, uh, how do we deal with the ecological limits that we are up against? What's the imaginary around that? And Meda, you had, I just want to remind you that there was something you were going to say about what David said last also. So. 
difficult to link the two, but uh, right. <laughs> I was saying that uh, we were uh, built upon or cultivated upon the left to the center literature, <laughs> not just Marxist, but also Gandhian, which is also left to the center, or the Ambedkarian, which is also left to the center, um, uh, and so on. When we found that um, the face of the bourgeois is um, expanding to include the industrial working class, that section which gets co-opted or absorbed, and also um, some of those political circles and sections uh, which would be uh, very greatly ideologically progressive but uh, not in their own lives or in their political lives. Then uh, we thought the new left and the filling up the space by the fourth front or the fifth front and we go on adding to that and we are always the last <laughs> as if the last, the last is one. the best <laughs> so no claims no confidence but um, the confidence of course but uh, no great optimism to change everyone and yet uh, i think the people who are filling that space created uh, which is left space uh, in a way uh, they are teaching the lessons and they are uh, uh, redefining the terms the real estate development <laughs> what is real in that <laughs> you know it is that's why i said you know it's the america iraq interaction um, and so on so uh, you know some are the gibrils and some are the heftes and they are playing the role and all the institutions are getting manipulated just as in the case of libya they did you know the african union and the arab league and ultimately even the security council of un so all these are coming to the help of those in the mainstream politics and uh, taking those by horns to the extent one can with the blood on our hands not because we have killed anyone but we, we have held on to that is something that the people are perseverantly uh, facing and there all these uh, ideological frameworks come to help but one has to bring all those together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the Marx ownership of means of production is very very close to the uh, idea of Gram Swaraj. The Ambedkar struggle also was not only to ask the Dalits to leave the villages and go to the cities and if he was alive today he would have never said that. <laughs> he would have said that hold on wherever you are even on the periphery of the village and get on to the mainstream of the village community. There also the fight should continue. It doesn't end by saying community is the great. Because he had also shown that path of the Dalits to assert the right to the tank in the village in Maharashtra, so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. I think somewhere all the ideas were uh, leading the communities to societies towards self-reliance and that is democracy. <laughs> it is not representative, it is not uh, within the uh, certain given forms of politics or uh, uh, retained and uh, obtained through the vote bank uh, and the note bank politics. So I think uh, that is what uh, needs to be really understood. And uh, what was your question? I forgot. Ecology. <laughs> Ecology. <And> broadly, broadly <laughs> extractive industries. And uh, in this, I think that kind of a self reliant way of looking at the resources in one's hands which is not devoid of sharing but which is to be in the new democratic forms which we define with the principle of subsidiarity where you have the principle of eminent domain of the state we want the principle of eminent domain of the people and hence they will have the first right to resources and they would hopefully no, nothing is really tried out but one hopes that they would not clear fell the forest they would not sell the rivers once it belongs to the community even to the next door community and they would not uh, extract not only because they would not have those kinds of extracting mechanisms and machinations but also because they would know the stakes 
involved and rooted in the resources at hand which are the stakes for survival so they would not go and discuss climate change in Copenhagen or Cancun <laughs> but they would like to be aware of and conscious of and up against any negative change and impacts around them in their small little environs which will be the inclusions but not ex enclosures now that kind of spirit we have to also cultivate partly it is there which is being killed and attacked and so we are countering it on the other hand it is to be inculcated and I'm not saying the outside catalytic activists come in and then inculcate the spirit <laughs> but somewhere that process of discourse dialogue mm -hmm. interaction must go on and uh, when will be the time in 2050 when the rivers would be dried and the coal would be extracted and finished or when the climate change uh, I just gave that story yesterday that uh, in the environment ministry one senior most official had said during our interaction that uh, look and I said why don't you bring these debates down to earth in the communities he said no 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 that time has not yet come because the climate change has not yet started having any impacts <laughs> at the down level <laughs> so this is the understanding you know I will tell you in confidence the name of the official only to the Indians <laughs> or to the non-Indians <laughs> they will be harmless but uh, it is certainly this you see and hence I think but the hope is not only that there will also be a selfishness to preserve and conserve the resources and use those with the right kind of pace and with the right kind of technology which will be appropriate but also because the people would relate to those resources and that relationship between the human and the nature is what has held on mm -hmm. it is not the new relationship between the market and the howsoever regulated it may be first deregulate and then the regulate all the regulatory authorities in India are playing the role in favor of marketization and privatization whether in water sector power <coughs> sector whichever so it's uh, uh, fake and the facade. What is necessary is to really um, uh, allow this relationship to flourish. Mm -hmm. and that's why maybe we will have to start with the new generation, the next generation to have that. But then the climate change and the crisis, suddenly the crisis uh, in human unnatural one can say mm -hmm. crisis faced by the uh, Fukushima and uh, others uh, I think has shaken the faith in the nuclear power you know somewhere something shakes I hope the faith in the hydropower which mm -hmm. is considered as cheap and clean and the thermal power again is also looked at with caution since uh, we have paid the um, cost but then what is left we are asked so it's a new story altogether it's not so new for those who have been drying their clothes in the solar energy <laughs> and those who are looking at the wind to decide which direction the ship should move and so on so it's right there but in the new context if it is really turning the wheel back it will be opposed but if you show this is taking the wheel ahead they are taking it in another direction the wind power is sold to the companies like Sujalam and the solar power project was to be that of Enron in the state of Rajasthan with the greatest subsidy that kills the whole purpose that kills the whole vision that distorts the whole alternative paradigm mechanism to the goals and uh, hence the not just the choice of technology but the choice of these relationships between the nature and the humans and between the human and the human <laughs> that really needs to be defined redefined and everything is human with full of flaws and frauds all of that is not going to end even if the community takes over but somewhere we feel that it will be much less of exploitation and hence while the expropriators must be expropriated <laughs> we will also have to have the appropriate <laughs> of everything uh, David can I ask you to uh, 
go from a maximum of two minutes per because we get at least 35 minutes for the audience. Okay. All right. Well, my, my approach to the um, environmental issue is very much of the sort I outlined just now that I would want to sort of start to think about, well, what are the new technologies that can work? What kind of new social relations need to be constructed? How would daily life be changed? And, 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 and institutional arrangements and all the rest of it. Because there is a tendency, I mean, for instance, that, uh, in this country, the debate is, oh, there's going to be a technological fix. Uh, and that's going to take care of it all. Uh, we don't have to change daily life. I mean, my view in this country is if you wanted to do something really serious about the environment, we would change daily life. You would uh, demolish the suburbs, for example, which is a rather big project. Uh, but, uh, and actually employ a lot of people. So I think, you know, you could, you could really solve the employment problem and the environmental problem by just demolishing the, the suburbs. Um, so so I, I kind of th think that, that it's, it's very important to see those interrelations because otherwise you get into this notion that there is a single kind of way in which you can, can approach, approach this. And of course also mental conceptions, as we were talking about earlier, are terribly, terribly important. We have a furious argument going on with you know, a lot of the energy companies and the rest of it going out of their way to create disinformation about global warming and the science and all the rest of it. So it's, it's uh, I think, a, a very, a very, you know, again, there's a lot of struggle that has, has to go on around this. But certainly, if we think about the transformations that might occur in society uh, over the next 10, 15 years, you certainly would have to think about a transformation in our relation to nature. And there is a lot of thinking about that and, and a lot of rhetoric uh, around that. And I, so I think, and we see this in the Cochabamba Declaration and, 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 and the like. So I think there are, there are things uh, happening and I think that the attack upon agribusiness and the recognition that the, the supposed uh, huge productivity of agribusiness actually is r r rather fraudulent, uh, that compared to that uh, more uh, labor-intensive forms of agriculture are actually far more productive and to the degree that there's an employment problem right now then it seems to me again one of the ways in which you could approach the kind of question of employment and environment is to move back to more labor-intensive forms of uh, agriculture uh, w which uh, you know again wouldn't necessarily ha give people a huge kind of income I mean he wouldn't uh, be like a hedge fund manager or doing that but on the other hand there, there could be you know, agricultural work of that kind has often been very hard and historically hasn't been, you know, hasn't, hasn't, hasn't always been fun. But there are ways, I, I think, in which you can start to reconstruct the agrarian base. And I think, you know, the mineral kind of extraction stuff is really reaching horrendous uh, points right now. And, 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 and the, the, there's, a par there's a deep paradox in here, too, that, that some of the new technologies that are supposed to be environmentally friendly, like wind power, they actually require rare earth metals and the mining of rare earth metals uh, well, there are two things about it one it's an environmental disaster in its own right and the second thing about it globally is that 95 percent of the trade in rare earth metals is controlled by china for the simple reason that the chinese don't care about environmental impacts and 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 so now what's happening is realizing the geopolitics of that in this country we're now likely to see rare earth metal mining going on in, in the american southwest which is very very difficult uh, to do without uh, serious environmental damage. So, you know, you, you say, well, this is going to rescue us over here, and then you kind of say, but we've got to destroy this over there. So uh, this doesn't get us uh, terribly far when we start to look at these relations. All right. Posco, that in POSCO kind of mm -hmm. situation, one special factor is that uh, beyond the natural calamity, when the community rebuilt itself, <laughs> It has so much of sustenance after the, after there, the just, yeah, after the cyclone, the same Navadi Prot and all. Now, just on the issue of entitlements, uh, they are considered as, uh, you know, without any capacities and capabilities. And that is granted to the outside company mm -hmm. that is getting the iron ore at the cost or the price, which is even less than what is given uh, to the Indian companies. Yeah. So it is also uh, not the just corporates versus the people, but the corporates versus the corporates, where again this part of the world rules and dominates beyond limits. <laughs> so there should be the not limits, but stop, stoppage of the inflow of the capitals and the capitalists. I wanted to talk about the case of the CEC of Andhra 
Bangladesh, Trick City. Uh, how can we believe, or at least people have been already disposed? People have been already disposed from those areas, and at the same time, the government has presented already deals to the foreign direct investment. Do you believe there is an, an any? Do you believe there is any way to to work together the the foreign the foreign direct investment with the situation that is already in a CEC and and at the end it can give something good for the region or the people? CEC of Andhra Pradesh. Yeah. Yes. Which is the in city? Huh? And well, electronic city, which yes, is Chirala. Okay. Yeah. A question about does the rural urban divide as we know it does it matter in terms of theorizing it in terms of strategies and also the the north south divide and and what kind of discussion in places like New York or what kind of campaigns would help on the land issue? In the spaces or the political projects that you see uh, to, that challenge uh, the role of uh, finance capital. And in terms of all the different levels at which change might, we might imagine it happening. On that lo level of organization, um, what possible kind of innovations can we see to surpass exactly this problem of, uh, you know, if we give purely self-control to each group of people, we still have sort of larger issues, more common issues to resolve. And, and I think right now one of the great impasses we have globally is that the only systems or organizations that we have to deal with those common problems are on a molar level, on a, on a level of state or even corporate bodies, and so we have no uh, recourse to organize differently those common issues. So what, I mean, I know that there's been social forums and things like that, so I'm just curious what you both think in terms of the, the innovations that might have to take place of solidarity or commons that, that require almost decision making that wouldn't you know, take the recourse to state or, or these smaller structures. You see the um, cities <laughs> and that's linked to the rural hinterlands um, are growing <coughs> abundantly uh, again at the cost of uh, both the communities within uh, which may also be decades old like the fish workers colonies which uh, that really formed the Mumbai of the present days originally now they are the ugly looking slums and they should be taken away and with this whole infrastructure which is uh, import and export based and which is for the elitist kind of communication, whether through electronic or to the, um, uh, what do you call it, the transport uh, ways, that is something which is again taking a toll of both the rural areas by having the great cuts in budget in their favor to the uh, wrong kind of uh, uh, visions incorporated into the plans which are compelled to be acceptable to the other population who might not have even thought of it and then think of the mobility towards those and hence the pull and push factors work between in the relationship between the urban and rural all this is happening and this is on the fast track since the neoliberalism has shown its greatest force and impact. So that is also to be questioned. Now it may start uh, by the people who are direct, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, directly uh, affected people, those who face the immediate backlash, who may not conceive of the larger divide or the long term impacts. Uh, but then, you know, it starts at least there. And uh, I think uh, this divide is coming to the fore now because of the uh, no right to shelter possible even after coming to cities. And people feel like going back, but there are no routes. I talk about the future agenda, even the immediate agenda. And then uh, they are now becoming a movement. 
uh, because the urban poor otherwise the mass did not maybe think of it in the industrial uh, in that kind of context but the proletariat within the country would have 50 percent uh, living in the cities as the world bank has estimated and it looks like the real estimates <laughs> although their agenda is or their prescription is to adjust structures and cultures and then then say that okay this is a natural flow from the rural to urban so let it be don't stop it unnaturally by giving the guarantee of employment in the rural areas which too is guarantee of just 100 days manual labor employment which is no great killing the generation's old livelihoods which could be harnessed which could have been developed in different ways with which could have got the technological and other inputs but just killing those saying those are backwards saying those are valueless when they are in the hands of the people till they come to the market in the form of teak wood or uh, fish or water then it gets immediately gains the value through the market valuations so all of this in the case of urban poor you know where which percentage of which in the indian population is growing and that is promoted encouraged facilitated seen as symbols of progress that needs to be questioned and is being questioned but then these divides are also the divisions on the grounds of economic disparities and different ways i won't uh, elaborate that but the land in the rural area when it is uh, taken over for the dams and uh, then the extra land not submerged is taken over by Amitabh Bachchan and then that there comes the shopping mall or the five star hotel real stories mm -hmm. you know all of that so uh, this transfer of resources you know agriculture to non agricultural in between 1990 and 2005 60 100,000 hectares of land in India according to the economic surveys of 2008 were diverted from agriculture to non-agriculture. Now the agrarian economy where the farmers are committing suicides on one hand because the real value of the labor and the inputs from the nature are not coming through and also because of that then the land taken over and then transferred. So on one hand there is so much of interaction between the urban and rural, on the other hand the divide is growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the cities are expanding to take into it the rural villages, they are just, uh, what do you say, swaha kar rahe, you know, gulping those, <laughs> not just, uh, you know, taking into the fold of the municipal corporation. And uh, all those are the designs of the West. I must say this, uh, um, and so I would say come back <laughs> to those who can, <laughs> because uh, you know being here you cannot fight those that easily, but being there we are fighting from the east to west and that needs to be challenged. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean there are still some parts of the world where the distinction between urban and rural is very, very significant, uh, I, but I think the tendency under capitalism is to increasingly merge them to industrialize the countryside uh, so that uh, as a distinctive way of life it starts to disappear and I suspect that actually without knowing it I suspect that that is beginning to happen in India uh, particularly as more as you said more and more land is withdrawn from agriculture and you get you know the SEZs being put in agricultural areas and 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 the mining going on in other areas so it, it, it the, the distinction disappears I theoretically I prefer to use the concept of uneven geographical development but you know it's not a very sexy concept and it's hard to get people to kind of uh, get excited about that but you know in my own mind I'm thinking about you know there's a complicated process of uneven geographical development which is going on inside of cities and actually the unevenness within cities is just as important I think as the, the dis dis distinction between the cities and the countryside and and of course some parts of the countryside you know in this country for example have been taken over by mansions out on Long Island and something like that. It's where the bourgeoisie goes to rest after they've uh, stolen millions of dollars during the week. They go and get over it. They need to get over it. They've had, had a hard life, you know.
I, I, so I, I tend to think in 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 those in those terms, but there are uh, nevertheless I think some some very significant uh, differences between what is happening in, for instance, uh, North America and Europe right now, and what's happening in quote so-called emerging markets, which are actually much more dynamic right now. Uh, and and this is a kind of curious thing. I mean, most of the growth that's occurring in the world economy is occurring in countries like uh, India and China and all of those countries which are oriented to the trading with that part of the world. So if you're supplying raw materials to China, like uh, Chile or Australia, you're doing extremely well. Uh, and there's been really almost no depression there at all. Whereas, you know, so, so there's a lot of unevenness right now, which is creating a rather different situation with some geopolitical tension between the BRICS, as they're called, and, and, and the sort of traditional centers of uh, capital accumulation. Um, I think that the, 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 the kind of question of how to organize and, and, and challenge finance capital and so on is a very, uh, is a very complicated one and I, uh, we could probably spend sort of a uh, whole hour sort of talking, talking about it. Let me just say uh, a, a couple of things. Um, there are, there's a lot of movement going on around the world of different kinds. I mean, you have things like the factory occupations in Argentina, you have, uh, y you know, sort of the, the organization of solidarity economies, you, you have uh, you, a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, a lot of activity which, in which people are trying to find a way to have a decent life. Uh, without necessarily succumbing to the general capitalist modes of, uh, of, of doing things. And, and, and in part, this arises out of the fact that capital doesn't need most people anymore. I mean, capital looks at the world and sees a vast disposable reserve army of labor, and that's all they really care about, and, you know, let everybody worry about how to reproduce themselves. But there are things going on of that sort and and some of these are outside of the realm of finance capital and some of them have uh, actually been economically quite uh, successful. I mean, one of the examples would be something like a, uh, a collective like Mondragon that has now about 200 enterprises throughout Europe. And, and the distinction, everybody in Mondragon is a shareholder in, in what happens and, and, and the biggest disparity of return that people inside of that get is one to three. Uh, that is, uh, the, the somebody has a superior managerial position or skills may get three times as much as somebody else in the corporation. Now, typical American corporation now, the distinction is something like one to six hundred. Uh, and I think that the, the, this is something that's, that is radically different and is very successful and, and is efficient and, and, works, and works quite well. Uh, and, and, and I think that, the, the, but their genius was that they, they, they moved and, and started to take over various other aspects of the, of the capitalist system. Not only were they producers, but they also created their own credit institutions, which is absolutely vital. And they also created their own retail outsets, which, outlets, which were also very vital, so that you, know, you start to colonize much of the remaining economy. Having said that, I, I really find myself a bit, uh, a, a lot of political movements that, that, that I encounter, and I do so in Latin America and, and other places. There's a problem of what I would call the fetishism of organizational form, that actually many of these organizations insist on rem in being local and remaining local. Many of them exist on being purely horizontal and, and, and resist any form of hierarchical decision making. Many of them are completely, uh, radically opposed to any negotiation or discussion with the state. And, and as far as they're concerned, taking state power is a false move because we know the state always betrays us, which of course the state has been betraying us over the last 30 years, no question about it. But the result of that is that you're not in a position, and I have arguments with, with the people saying, you know, it's very hard to scale up what you're doing from this very local kind of effort into something that's going to be able, to, can go global. And, 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 and in some cases people say they're not even interested in doing that. 
you know, and they actually actively say, no, well, you're obviously a Leninist if you start talking that way, you know, and I say, well, I'm not a Leninist, I'm just trying to be sensible, and they kind of go, and, you know, so we get into big, big fights. So I think, I think there's, a, there's, there's a kind of a, and, and it, it, there's an appeal of anarchism and autonomista and communalism and, and locality and all the rest of it right now, which is, which is very predominant in, in politics. But there are organizations that start to put it together. I mean, Via Campesina is a, has about two million people in it right now, and it does put it together. So I think the whole kind of question of how to put things together, which have a lot of vitality at the local level, have a lot, have a lot of, and a lot of terrifically good ideas at the local level, how to put that together in a way that actually makes a global movement and can deal with finance capital on the global level and can deal with the global environmental issues and so on. That's, that seems to me one of the big challenges. How would the global community contribute to make these initiatives successful? So I'm really looking for examples of solutions and, you know, if you can. Okay. Regarding the social, the self-oriented uh, As for my understanding, based on one report uh, published by one of the South Indian, state government, Vision 2020, uh, the government clearly said to the World Bank that the complete education system is going to be changed in Andhra Pradesh uh, because that ch the change in the production, uh, the, the corporate production industry. You know, one of the troubles with uh, utopian plans is they often invoke some notion of harmony which is static. And I have to say that uh, most utopian plans of that sort strike me as very boring. I once pointed this out to some theologians and they said, well that explains why no Christians want to go to paradise because it's very boring. <laughs> and I, I, I think that actually one of the phrases I took from philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, he, he talked about nature, he said, as being about uh, the perpetual pursuit of novelty. And I think human nature is very much about the perpetual pursuit of novelty. So if you're thinking of a utopian schema, you've got to start thinking about, well, what kinds of human development and capacities and powers do we have within us? Uh, you know, artistic, expressive, uh, many of which are completely suppressed in a commercial culture. So it seems to me there's almost infinite capacity for the development of human capacities and powers. And that obviously has to have a material base. So I'm not saying that everywhere in the world should be zero growth, but frankly we have a very adequate and material base in much of the world right now to simply freeze it much where it is and to say, well, okay, let's, let's look at the development of human capacities and powers on the part of everyone instead of, you know, sending a few people to very elite institutions where they just learn bourgeois crap and then they come out and kind of say that's the truth of the world. So I kind of, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I think that the vision here has to be about not, not a utopia that is static, but one that is, which, which, which is flowering and, and can perpetually exploring new possibilities and powers in terms of social relations uh, and, 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 and uh, technologies and all the rest of it. I think that just, uh, we're very creative and that creativity, I think, deserves to flourish, um, but not necessarily uh, be channeled as it is right now by corporate capital into endless growth. All right. I think the um, uh, to s just link with uh, his uh, not to permit the growth of either goods, services, or capital, which would bring in more of inequity, injustice, uh, a parasitic existence of a few on the majority, which is exploited and expropriated, uh, growth with justice, and all these conceptual. Uh, clarifications uh, come to our help. But basically, not that there should be no change, but change in the value framework, which will not be termed as growth uh, in the GDP and six kind of indicator-based uh, conceptualization, but which would certainly uh, bring in change, continue to bring in change, even the redistribution of the resources to make uh, the two ends meet or harness the resources, uh, not to allow the inequity to persist, which exists today, change will be necessary. Uh, indigenous communities also themselves would think of changing if they interact with uh, nature or other human societies. 
but uh, who would define and decide what should be the change is the critical question and hence while uh, while responding to the present crisis which is uh, you know exploiting the majority and uh, so on and so forth and the nature uh, one would say zero growth model uh, uh, many times we feel uh, zero aid model also should be because uh, you know once with Brutland we were sharing a dais in Germany on the north-south dialogue was the theme and uh, the question was uh, being hotly debated whether one percent of the GDP from this part uh, of the world uh, each country that is so-called developed country although 800 people are in the prisons out of one lakh and what not uh, <coughs> then uh, whether it should be one percent or seven percent <laughs> and we said zero percent because all that is coming from outside which is in sourcing <laughs> is uh, resulting in outsourcing <laughs> in a way so uh, that is also to be somewhere stopped or uh, restrained and questioned um, because the human capital that the countries like us have is not flowing and cannot flow freely. There are borders and there are walls and there are attacks and so on. Uh, so even the one kind of capital taking over the toll, taking the toll, is something which is problematic. So these present models which are growth intensive, which are aid intensive, which are capital intensive, which are resource intensive, uh, those need to be challenged and the alternatives also do not come from outside but they exist uh, to a great extent and uh, there can be change appropriately with appropriate space, pace, uh, scale but uh, that is being uh, all perverted because of the so-called uh, interaction where market and money is the mediators uh, and hence the education <coughs> there comes the role of education. Now education, I was a student of education also, just as physical science. Uh, you know, where imbibing an inculcation of values and imparting of training from one generation to another generation, that is how we defined it. Uh, how would that really be inclusive of all that we are discussing and debating today? Uh, what kind of educational institutions would be appropriate? Again, if the people and people have to do it, just as the courts are not paying the uh, service, uh, although considered as pillar of democracy, we are having people's tribunals. Everything we are adding peoples to it. You know, the people's media, the people's politics and so on. What is that? This kind of idea of the human beings, not just even the people as citizens or something, really matter. They have lords and who are these so-called 544 representatives in the Indian parliaments or across the world. Uh, that questioning should come and that assertion also should come from within this generation where there is a will, there is a way and also the another generation. And that's where these educational initiatives of the new kind uh, should and can make a difference. I'm not saying Jeevan Chalas are making all that great difference, but uh, maybe it's satisfying us. But it is also first learner generation coming out, which is not typically coming out from the Jilla Parishad, the local self-government schools. So they are different. They are more self-reliant. <coughs> They are also national athletes now leading the teams when their families are still in the hut-like houses, lands submerged. They are also becoming the teachers coming back to the schools and the full-time activists. Handful of them, handful of them are dropping out, handful of them are passing to the same mainstream education. But these kinds of what are colloquially called, conventionally called as experimental schools, cannot remain just uh, isolated experiments but they can be dispersed and decentralized because that's the nature of the alternative vision you can start one around with the four children around you and then it goes on you know? so i think those kinds of uh, initiatives 
are a must and at the formal education level we must insist on the equity in education even if it is a curriculum given it should be the same curriculum for all the bureaucrats child as well as the construction workers child that would also make some difference even if the wrong curriculum is given let it be but let everyone have it at the same time and free education in what sense during the exercise our children build those uh, houses for the school the rooms which you saw uh, darkened after submergence and they flew away and still there is so much of life uh, below you see the colorful pictures of this year's bal mela where the children made a drama and children prepared a film and what not so that is the you know possible uh, how to really you know inbuilt all of this the cultural diversity to the uh, intellectual diversity into that equitable educational processes and discourses uh, that is uh, really to be thought of and start it where it is don't wait for any of these i think if we wait and we go on debating till that comes up somewhere from given either west or east or heaven then it is never going to happen maybe a small way you know one's own lifestyle we are all on the continuum of compromises <laughs> but let us start it use little less water little less energy let less number of clothes and so on and uh, less number of waste paper and so on the waste paper you use more but the paper you use less uh, all of that you know i think uh, will make a beginning thank you so much